Welcome to Data Driven Health Radio. Hey everybody, this is Dave Korsunski from Data Driven Health Radio, and we are back with a new series on the podcast, and we call this series Quick Hits. And on this series, we really just want to go very deep into one topic, keep it short and concise, and get you back to your day. So with me today is my good buddy, Dr. John Lemansky, and we are going to talk about the adverse health effects of vegetable oils and industrial seed oils. So welcome, John, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, hey, Dave. How's it going? Doing wonderful. Thank you. So just to set some context for everybody here on how John and I got started on this topic, we were out skiing one day, and I was about to take a huge bite of my delicious omelet when uh, Dr. John started grilling me on the dangers of the vegetable oils (laughs) that the omelet was most likely cooked in. So completely ruined my appetite for this delightful omelet and we figured well we might as well make a positive out of this thing and share some of that information that you shared with me over breakfast with the rest of our listeners so yeah i'm not, I'm not really invited to many meals these days no you can call you can show up after i eat from now All right. that'll work that'll work yeah. you can pretend yeah so john we're gonna put 10 minutes on the clock here we want to be super concise with these segments so i'm starting yep. the timer now and just share with with uh, everyone listening what you shared with me about how these oils work in the body how they get stuck how to avoid them what we can do about it just how do we educate ourselves around this topic yeah well thanks for that introduction i think it's important that people understand so where i'm coming from i i promote more of a ketogenic uh, way of eating and i know you do as well Indeed. um and so within that spectrum there's a lot of different ways to do it right and so now that keto is becoming quite popular in the mainstream i think it's important that people understand that it's not just um, a question of okay i eat a lot of fat and it doesn't matter what type of fat i eat absolutely it matters it makes a big difference um and so one of the things that when you and i were having breakfast i just noticed that if you go out to a fast food restaurant or any kind of restaurant really or eat packaged food majority of the oil that you're going to get is actually a vegetable oil or a seed oil or something like that. And so you and I started talking about some of the impacts that those oils can have on the body. And it actually can be quite detrimental to your health. Um, Hey John, can I jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Before you go further, can you define vegetable and seed oils? Because I think even that is something that we need to unpack a little bit. Yeah. So uh, you know, seed oil is, is technically a type of vegetable oil. I would say vegetable oil is going to be kind of the overarching, um, you know, label for oil such as soybean oil, um, canola oil, which is a, a byproduct of rapeseed oil. Um, other ones that are out there, sunflower oil, um, soybean oil, I think I mentioned. Um, safflower? So, I've heard sa- that Safflower is another big one. So if you if you start looking at ingredients, Um, you'll notice that there's a lot of different types of vegetable oils that are are being promoted as heart healthy. And it all, you you have to kind of understand historically how we got to this point. So when saturated fat became really persona non grata, labeled as the cause of heart disease, uh, companies started figuring out a different type of oil to use. And when you start making products that need to have long shelf lives, well, things like olive oil don't sit very well if they don't bake very well. Mm-hmm. Things like lard, which used to be used as the main driver of all these products, well, now that has a high saturated fat content, and so companies couldn't use that anymore. So they started looking around for different kind of products that they could use. And one of the ones they found that was the most successful was the vegetable oils. But even then, they had to do more chemical kind of chemistry to them to make them more stable. So oils in general, if they're in a liquid form, they're pretty unstable. In order to have a long shelf life for products, you need to hydrate, hydrogenate them, basically put a hydrogen atom on the actual molecule. And that makes it into kind of a a solid state that they can use in breads and chips and all those things. The problem with that is because of the, the way that that is created, you get a lot of trans fats. If you go back into chemistry, whenever you have a, a double bond in, in any 
kind of situation, you can have something called cis or trans. And all that means is the orientation of the molecule. But for humans, trans fats have been shown to be very detrimental to health, including cardiovascular health, cancer, pro-inflammatory. And so it took about 25 years for the FDA to actually remove them. But you still have the problem of the vegetable oils being there and being the major, major oil that we consume. And if you go to like, so for instance, when we were having breakfast, I, I asked specifically the waitress, okay, well, what do you guys use to cook the food in? Do you use butter? And she said, yes, we use butter. And I said, okay, well, can you, can you double check? Is it really butter? Is it margarine? What do you guys use? And she came back and said, well, it's actually margarine, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing as butter. Yep. So that's how we started kind of talking about the issues with vegetable oils. So I think we take canola oil because that's really the biggest one that you see in the market. Even if you go to Whole Foods, you'll see, you know, at their hot bar, usually the main ingredient is canola oil. And canola oil is <clears throat> derived from rapeseed. And it's ori originally really in Canada. And canola oil is actually kind of a, a play on words. Um, it's for Canadian oil low acid. Mm. And so if you go historically with this type of oil, initially in the 1950s, it was used as a lubricant for machinery. And so it was banned for people to actually consume it. And what they did is they kind of tweaked the formula a little bit, and then eventually the FDA accepted it as um, a type of oil that we can consume as humans. So, so when that I, in and of itself when is in, scary. When I'm in a pinch, John, and my car has broken down, I can just get the, uh, <laughs> canola oil and, and pour it into the engine and, and probably get by. So that's, that's a sad state of affairs. Well, so funny enough, there was a guy in Australia and what he did is he actually converted his car over so that he could use the frying oil, like the vegetable oils from fast food places, um, as fuel. And he drove across Australia just using that. Obviously, well, we, he had to convert yeah, it a little bit. We have to find that story and link to it. So we, yeah. got, we got four minutes here, John. So okay. we're down how these oils are in the body. Yep. The part that was interesting to me is, is basically just how they – the non-technical term is just how they get stuck and then yeah. what we do about it. Yeah. So a couple of major things to understand. So, you know, the mo majority of component of the vegetable oil is going to be a polyunsaturated and monounsaturated type of fat. Why does that matter? So those types of fats, some are okay, but the polyunsaturated have a lot of these double bonds that make them more um, applicable to, to be um, oxidized, meaning, Oxygen goes to the double ball and destroys it, and you get a lot of things called free radicals. Free radicals. Yeah, free radicals are normal part of the body. Your yep. immune system uses them to destroy bacteria, viruses, so it's a normal production. The unfortunate part is that you're overwhelming the system by having too many of these oils causing too many free radicals, which Got leads it. to aging, leads to cell Your death, body. leads to apoptosis. Yeah, exactly. The second thing that happens is this is a high omega-6 type of fat. Got it. So in the body, we want to try to maintain a ratio of one-to-one -one of omega-6 to omega-3. Yep. Why does that matter? Omega-6 tend to be pro-inflammatory. Um, when you look at the kind of pathway that it, it goes down, you get a lot of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which your body needs. Again, we're not saying you get rid of all omega-6s, but you need to do a better ratio. The average American diet is 20 to 1. 20 so to 1. So 20, we're way 20 omega -6. Over on the inflammatory side of things, presumably yeah. because of, we're, we're consuming excess amounts of, one of many reasons, but one is due to the excessive amounts of these types of oils. Exactly. So, you know, 20 omega 6s to 1 omega 3 is pretty average. Because it's in everything, and it's been labeled as heart healthy, so now people feel, okay, well, it's heart healthy, I can consume it. Absolutely not. So, John, Things, um, I know you can get an omega-6, omega-3 test done as well. Yes. That's, a, that's, a, that's a biomarker that people can measure if they're curious about where their ratio stands. Is that correct? You can, and I think it's one of the more important tests that you can do for your body to see where you stand. Yep. Yeah. Um, the other kind of pro-inflammatory production, you get something called interleukin-6, and then you yes. get cytokines that really kind of drive this pro-inflammatory state. You'll hear inflammation talked a lot about just kind of out there. Yeah. Well, it's more specific than that. There's specific inflammation. 
the other thing that happens is they're still uh, producing trans fats. So the way the FDA um, kind of got around this is that if there's less than 0.5 grams of trans fats within the product, it can be labeled as zero trans fat. But if you're consuming a lot of these things, then you actually are consuming quite a bit of trans fats in your body. And these things, once they get into the cell membrane, so every cell in your body has a double membrane, it's called a phospholipid membrane. And these are made up of fatty acids. So when you consume these things, they get stuck in those membranes. And once they get stuck, they become really hard, almost like uh, plastic is what it's been described as. And once it becomes plastic, the cell doesn't function very well and your body tries to get rid of it. And so you continue to get this pro-inflammatory kind of cascade. Your body sees this as poor and it tries to get rid of it. And then that happens in all the cells in your body, specifically your liver. So your liver gets absorbed a lot of these, your brain. And these things don't function as well. And how do we, how do we process this? How do we get rid of this if, if we find that we already have a high ratio, if we're already seeing signs of inflammation in the body through different biomarkers, through, Ella, through a low HRV? How do we process this? And, and what are the best, I guess, for maybe detoxification is the right word, but what can we do about it? Yeah, and that's the thing. It's, it's hard. So really the best things that you can do is, is to start off with trying to get that ratio back to one-to-one. -one. So start consuming really good omega-3 products. Uh, yep. Stop consuming vegetable oils. If I see a vegetable oil in a product, I will not eat it. If I go to a restaurant, I'll specifically ask, what do you guys use to cook with? Cool. Because a lot of times, you know, they'll say olive oil and it's really a blend. Yep. Or they'll say butter and it's really margarine. Yep. So things that you can consume that have high omega-3, really good fish, so wild-caught salmon, um, you know, fish eggs, really good wild eggs, pasture-raised eggs, really good beef, really everything that we promote in a ketogenic lifestyle, you consume, um, but you just have to really push that ratio. Second thing you can do is fast. So if you do some intermittent fasting or longer-term fasting, your body will process a lot of those um, dysfunctional cells, get rid of them. Yep. And, and if you introduce the good omega-3 fats and saturated fats, then when you rebuild, you're actually rebuilding a, a much better cellular membrane. Perfect. Yeah. That's right on the money, wow, John. Wow, that was good. 10, that ten was minutes good on the button. Now, yeah. I know you've done a lot of research on this topic, so we're also going to include some of the references for people who want to do their own homework in the show notes. We can also include some of the biomarkers that Dr. Lemansky may recommend looking at if you want to assess your own level of inflammation and omega-3, 6 ratio. And what else, John? Yeah, I think that's a good start. I think, um, you know, tune in for more of these episodes. We're going to discuss um, a lot of biomarkers and specific little hacks that you can do to improve your health. And um, I'll definitely get that information over to you. Sounds great, man. Thanks for being the first guest on the quick hits. I think we came in right on time and yeah. looking forward to doing more of these. It was an honor. Thank you. Keep All up right, the John. great work. All, All right. right thanks. Bye. Bye.